When I first took statistics, I was baffled by a concept called degrees of freedom. This came up all the time in probability distributions like the chi-square, t, and f distributions, and also in just calculating the sample variance where you divide by n minus one instead of by n. I wasn't the only one. None of the other students got it, and I don't think the teacher did either. This seems to be true for everybody I've talked to. In fact, it's almost a rite of passage to make it through a statistics class without understanding what degrees of freedom is really all about. Now, the way it's typically covered goes something like this. Degrees of freedom captures the amount of information that is free to vary in some calculation. For example, if you collect 10 data points, that's 10 numbers that could all be, well, different numbers. So we have 10 degrees of freedom. If you then use these data to calculate some statistic, like maybe the mean, then you'll have used up a piece of information and so have one fewer degree of freedom. When you go to calculate some other statistic that depends on the mean, like the variance, then you'll need to take this into account, and that's why you divide by n minus one instead of n here, nine instead of 10. But this explanation never felt rigorous or even very intuitive to me. It just felt like a lot of hand-waving. While most people might have just moved on with their lives, this never stopped bothering me. Then one day, I saw the answer posted on Twitter. The rank of the projection matrix inside the quadratic form in the definition of a statistic. Gee, that's crystal clear, don't you think? Well, this raised many more questions than answers and sent me down some long and deep rabbit holes. The good news is that this answer is actually really quite satisfying. Along the way, we'll learn a whole framework for understanding geometrically what's going on under the hood when we do a lot of statistics. Hence, while this series is about degrees of freedom, maybe the appropriate subtitle would be The Geometry of Statistics. In terms of background, I'm assuming that you've taken at least an introductory statistics course. And in fact, I'm going to assume that you absorbed that course pretty well, and that you're comfortable with concepts like probability distributions and expected value. It would also be really great if you have some linear algebra knowledge. If you haven't studied that, there's an excellent YouTube series entitled The Essence of Linear Algebra by 3 Blue One Brown, and watching that will give you all the background you need for this series. But that said, I'm gonna do my best to give brief recaps of the linear algebra concepts you'll need to know as they come up. Speaking of which, for the next two minutes or so, I'm gonna review vectors and vector addition. Skip ahead if you are very comfortable with these concepts. We'll think of vectors primarily as arrows in space. A vector has a length, called its magnitude, and it also has a direction, basically what angle it's pointing. But importantly, these are all it has. If we move this vector elsewhere in space, it's not a different vector. It's still considered the same one because it still has the same length and direction. To represent vectors algebraically, we can use their components in some coordinate system. You get these by moving the tail of the vector to the origin and then reading off the coordinates of where its tip lands. It's customary to write them as a column vector matrix, like this, and we can assign this to a variable name if we want, like this. We can multiply vectors by numbers, which will change their length, but not their direction. So multiplying by one half, for example, will make the vector half as long. We can multiply by negative numbers too, which makes the vector point the opposite way. Since it's scaling the length of the vector, this number we multiply by gets called a scalar. Finally, we can add and subtract vectors. Geometrically, we can add two vectors by moving the tail of the second vector to the tip of the first, and then drawing the new vector that connects the dots along both of them, like this. Subtraction just reverses that. To get the components of the new vector easily enough, all you have to do is add the components of the two vectors. For example, if I want to add this vector two, one to this vector minus one, one, we just add the components separately to get one, two. Okay, review over, let's get into it. Suppose we have a random variable X 
and we measure some observations, and we'll call these x1, x2, and so on, to xn. It would be pretty standard to represent this data as dots on a number line, maybe like this. To start, let's narrow this down so that we have just two data points. With only two observations, we have another option to visualize this, which is as some point in 2D space. We do that by putting the different possible values for x1 on the horizontal axis and the different possible values for x2 on the vertical axis. As an example, maybe when we draw our random numbers, we end up with 2 for x1 and 1 for x2, putting us at this point here. As you might have guessed, we're going to represent this point as a vector, so let's add an arrow and write the components as this column vector. Because x is a random variable, each time we sample data points from x, we'll get different values, which means we'll get a different point, which means we'll get a different vector. That's why we can refer to this vector as a random vector. For example, maybe on some different samples, we get other points like these. When we talk about degrees of freedom, what we're talking about is the number of dimensions of the space that this vector is free to land in, so to speak, across these different samples. For this vector here, although we could take different samples to get different vectors, if there are two observations, then it will always live in this two-dimensional space. Therefore, this random vector has two degrees of freedom. It's got two numbers that are free to vary across different samples. Where things get more interesting is when we start decomposing this vector. Take a look at this. We're always free to both add a number and subtract it, since the end result is just the same as where we started. So we're going to both add and subtract the sample mean of our two observations, which we'll call x bar. Then we can split these into two different vectors. The vector on the right just has the sample mean for both components, so let's call it the sample mean vector. On the left is a vector of what we call residuals. It's what's left over after we subtract the sample mean from each data point. Finally, just to keep things straight, I'll refer to the original vector as the data vector. To clean up a bit, we can factor the x bar out of the mean vector so we get the mean of x times a vector of ones. What we've done here is to decompose our original random vector into two other random vectors. Our original random vector had two degrees of freedom because it could land anywhere in the 2D plane, but our new vectors here do not have two degrees of freedom. In fact, they have split the original two so that each of these only has one degree of freedom. Why? Let's go back to the plane. If this is our random data vector x, then what we've done is to split it into two other vectors where this one is the sample mean vector, and this one is the vector of residuals. Recalling that adding vectors means adding them tip to tail, we can recover our original random vector as the sum of these two. First, let's look at the mean vector. Although the mean could be any number depending on our data, we saw that the mean vector is a multiple of the one one vector. Therefore, no matter what data points we encounter, the mean vector must lie somewhere on this line. It is not free to be anywhere in the plane. We're now limited to this line, and a line is only one dimensional. So that's why we say the sample mean vector has only one degree of freedom. As for the residual vector, it also is constrained to only lie on a particular line rather than pointing anywhere in the plane. Why is that? It turns out it's because the residuals always add to zero, no matter what the data points are. Intuitively, because the mean lies in the middle of the data, some of the observations will be above it, having a positive residual, and some will be below the mean, having a negative residual. These cancel each other out. If you'd like a more rigorous algebraic proof, that's on the screen now this idea that residuals around the mean sum to zero is going to come back repeatedly during this video series, so it may be worth spending a minute to make sure you get it.
Anyway, if the residuals always sum to zero, that means the residual vector has to be at a point where its components sum to zero. In 2D, that's always going to be somewhere on this line here, where the vertical coordinate is the negative of the horizontal coordinate. The possibilities here again trace out a line, which only has one dimension, so we say the residuals have just one degree of freedom. In other words, if we get told one of the residuals, then we instantly know the other, since it must just be the negative of the first one. So these are the two subspaces we're dealing with. By going some distance on this one, we get the mean, and then by adding in some distance in this residual direction, we bring in the residuals to get us to the actual data points. Even if we draw different random numbers for our random vector, like maybe these ones here, the mean and residual vector still have to live somewhere on these one-dimensional subspaces. And so we say those vectors have one degree of freedom. One important thing to note is that we're talking about the mean of the observations, usually called the sample mean and labeled X bar, and the degrees of freedom we just came to do not apply for the mean of the distribution that the observations came from, usually called the expected value or population mean and labeled mu. That's a bit perplexing at first because you might think, can't we just do the same composition we just did but with the population mean instead of the sample mean and get the same answer? Well, let's try it. Starting with our random vector x, we can make the same move of adding and subtracting mu, then splitting the vector in two. To keep the naming clear, I'll call these new vectors the expected value vector and the error vector. And that's because when you take a data point and subtract off the population mean, statisticians call that an error instead of a residual. But anyway, now it turns out that this error vector has two degrees of freedom while the expected value vector has zero. How can that be? It's because no matter what random numbers we generate, if they all come from the same distribution, then the expected value vector always points to the exact same spot. It can't land elsewhere on the line across different samples. It can only be on the same single point right here. Meanwhile, the error vector to make up the difference is no longer confined to a single line but might point in any direction in the plane, which you can see more easily if we don't move it to the origin. Another way to think about it is that, unlike the residuals we were dealing with earlier, the errors do not have to add to zero because the random numbers we happen to draw might not be perfectly centered around mu. The next question to ask is, how does this scale up when we have more than two data points? Let's add a third data point, bringing us to the, the third, third dimension. <laughs> now we'll have three observations of a random variable, and we use those three numbers as the coordinates for a point in 3D space. The arrow from the origin to that point will be our random vector. Because with different random samples, this vector could land anywhere in space, and this space now has three dimensions, we say this random vector has three degrees of freedom. Using the same logic as before, we can split our random vector into a sample mean vector and a vector of residuals. And as before, while our starting vector has three degrees of freedom, these component vectors will have fewer than that. The mean vector will still have just one degree of freedom, but now the residual vector will have two degrees of freedom. On the graph, our random data vector now looks like this. And we again break that vector into the tip to tail sum of the mean vector plus the residual vector. Since the mean vector is just a multiple of the 1, 1, 1 vector, it must always lie somewhere along this particular line, no matter where our data vector lands. 
Here's a few examples. Since it's limited to this one-dimensional subspace, we say the sample mean vector has one degree of freedom. For the residual vector, although the vector now has three components since we're in three dimensions, it still obeys the constraint that all the residuals must sum to zero. This is again because the sample mean lies in the middle of our observations, so the negative residuals exactly cancel out the positive residuals. That means that the components of the residual vector have to add to zero, and that's not true for all points in 3D space. It's only true for points that lie inside this plane here. In standard coordinate terms, you can think of this as the plane given by x plus y plus z equals zero. So if we were told what two of the residuals are, then we automatically know what the third one is, since it must be whatever adds to zero. Anyway, across different samples, the residual vector might land anywhere along this two-dimensional plane. So we say it has two degrees of freedom. Here's a few examples. So that's our sample mean vector and the residual vector. If we switch to the expected value vector and the error vector, then, similarly to before, the expected value is always in the same spot across different samples and so has zero degrees of freedom, which means the error vector could point in any direction and so has three degrees of freedom. That looks something like this. And although we can't visualize it, the same ideas carry over when we have more observations. The random vector showing all n data points is free to point any direction in n dimensional space, so it has n degrees of freedom. The sample mean vector always has one degree of freedom, and so lies somewhere on a line, and the residual vector always has n minus one degrees of freedom, because of the fact that the residuals are constrained to add to zero. That means if we are told what the first n minus one residuals are, then we know what the last one must be, and thus there can only be n minus one independent values. So the residual vector must land somewhere in an n minus one dimensional subspace. Meanwhile, if we were to consider the error vector and the expected value vector, the expected value vector still has zero degrees of freedom, because it always lands in exactly the same spot no matter which random numbers we draw, and so the error vector must have all n degrees of freedom. So now we've covered the basic idea of degrees of freedom as capturing how many different dimensions a random vector can land in across different samples. But remember the definition we're working towards, the rank of the projection matrix inside the quadratic form in the definition of a statistic. This explanation is going to take a while, and so this is just the first video in a series. It will take until chapter 4 to fully understand all that. Then afterwards, we'll turn toward the applications of degrees of freedom in classical statistics. And finally, we'll look into some extensions. To be frank, the voyage we're about to embark on is not a journey for the faint of heart. But, it offers great treasures to those who persevere. My promise to you is that if you follow along, you're eventually going to really understand what degrees of freedom is all about, and also where this N-1 stuff really comes from. And lucky for you, that's what we're going to turn to in the next chapter on Bessel's Correction. I'll see you then.